Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you'll hear the Higher Education Report from Andrew Smith and Katie Weaver. Words and their stories from Ana Mateo. And our next episode of America's Presidents with Kelly Jean Kelly. Now, here's Andrew Smith. Each year, thousands of legal professionals from around the world come to the United States for advanced legal training. They often choose to attend a Master of Laws program, or LLM. The LLM program is different from the Juris Doctor, or JD program. A JD degree is required for those who want to practice law in the U.S. In the LLM program, legal professionals learn about the U.S. government, the U.S. legal system, and international legal issues. They can specialize in several areas, including intellectual property, international business, immigration, human rights, and security. A 2020 study from the Center for Post-Secondary Research at Indiana University shows that international students make up 79% of LLM students at American law schools. One such student is Aime Mbarushimana. After practicing law for 15 years in Rwanda, Aime came to American University's Washington College of Law in Washington, D.C. to get advanced training in arbitration, mediation, and alternative dispute resolution. These are ways of settling disagreements without legal action. He said the training he received at American University helps support the traditional Ubuntu belief system in Rwanda. Ubuntu highly values building agreements and communities. He told VOA Learning English, that using more mediation can help lower the number of court cases in Rwanda and give judges more time to work on them. Mimosa Shala is a prosecutor in the Eastern European nation of Kosovo. She studies in the LLM program at Wake Forest University's School of Law in North Carolina. The school has partnered with the U.S. Departments of Justice and State for the last 10 years to train legal professionals from Kosovo. Shala's job in Kosovo includes working on cases of domestic violence. Wake Forest University, WFU, connected her with an American prosecutor who also works on domestic violence cases. And she learned how the two legal systems deal with the issues. Nishche Dagar of India worked for two years in trial law in his country before coming to WFU. Dagar said he now feels in love with professional ethics 
and wants to bring this training to his future work. He also sees the U.S. legal system as more efficient than India's, and he hopes to bring this organization to his work. The cost of attending LLM programs in the U.S. is usually higher than in other countries. However, students who spoke with VOA said the extra cost is worth it for many reasons. Law professors in the U.S. usually give students more individual help than those in their home countries. Besides office hours to study and receive advice, sometimes professors would invite groups of students to their homes for social gatherings. They also help students connect with working professionals and legal experts. Gabriel Ortiz of Venezuela recently completed his degree specializing in human rights law at American University. He noted that many professors are also experts in different legal areas. They include judges for the Inter-American Court and lawyers at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Ortiz also found that law students from Italy Turkey, Nigeria, and Myanmar also had similar issues in their home countries. He said, What I found interesting was to see how we share similar problems. We are able to know that the realities we are facing are not that different. Laura Orjuela from Colombia agrees with The American University law student said she has deepened her understanding of gender issues by talking with students from countries such as Iran, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. She added that when students compare so many international perspectives about the same issue, it helps increase the number of possible solutions they can use to fix problems. Maybe this thing we did in my country, it never worked. What they did in that country, we'll try it to see if that works, she said. Dagar from India said he highly values professional experience outside the classroom. These include pro bono or volunteer work, and special courts for people under age 18. WFU School of Law also has a North Carolina business court within the law school building where students can observe real court cases. Wen Wei and Li Ruoqi of China are students at Georgetown's law school in Washington, D.C. They said that because there are so many law students in China, having an LLM degree from one of the top law schools can help students get better jobs in China. LLM students in the U.S. must possess high levels of understanding of legal English. They usually have classes and attend social events with American students. As a result, their English skills can greatly improve during their LLM studies. Shahirnaz Joshi is an assistant dean of graduate and international programs at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., She said, many students have said, I thought I was coming for a degree, but the experience changed me forever. We're joined now by Andrew Smith, who just told us about 
LLM degrees here in the United States. Andrew, it was such an interesting story. I never knew so many international students came to the U.S. to learn about the legal system. That is true. They really do. And they come from a wide variety of countries. And that's part of the reason Gabriel Ortiz, who studied human rights at American University, told me that LLM programs are actually helping to form an international community of legal professionals. So, Andrew, LLM programs are not only for regular lawyers. Other kinds of legal professionals can pursue that degree, right? That's true. Um, in fact, all kinds of legal professionals study in them. For example, Chering Wanchuk, a 2003 graduate of the LLM program at George Washington University's Law School, also located in Washington, D.C., became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Bhutan, a country in the Himalayan Mountains, from 2014 to 2019. So these LLM students go far and wide around the world after they finish their degrees in the U.S. So, Andrew, can you tell us, are there any other reasons why international students want to attend LLM programs in the U.S. that you just didn't have room for in your story? Yes, I can. To practice law in the U.S., students must also pass what's known as a bar exam. And each state in the U.S. has its own bar exam. International students with an LLM degree are allowed to take the bar exam in some states. And New York is the most popular one. Wen Wei of China, who studies at Georgetown, explained to me that the New York bar exam is popular because New York is where many commercial contracts are handled. The New York bar also allows a person to work in 30 other jurisdictions, most of which are other states. She also said that passing the bar proves to employers in other countries that a person knows the details of the U.S. legal system. That sounds like a good reason for coming to the U.S. then. Andrew, thanks for this informative story. Perhaps some of our listeners will think about this course of study if they want to come to the U.S. Well, I, I think they might. And thank you so much for having me on the program. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. For today's program, we invite you to share a meal with us. Well, expressions about a meal, that is. Like most languages, English is filled with food expressions. Today, we will start with two appetizers, continue with the main dish, and finish with dessert. In other words, we take you from soup to nuts, or from the beginning to the end. With many meals, soup comes first, and nuts come last. So, if you do something from soup to nuts, you do everything from the beginning to the end. An appetizer is the first part of a meal. Our first appetizer today is alphabet soup. When you have a collection of letters of the alphabet that stand for several words, we can call it an alphabet soup. These can be the letters that show a job such as COO, or Chief Operating Officer. They could be letters that show someone's education, like an MBA, 
for a Master's of Business Administration and a Ph.D. for a Doctor of Philosophy. Let's say someone hands you their business card. After their name are the letters MBA, PhD, and COO. You can say, Wow, that is quite the alphabet soup after your name. But what is it you do exactly? Now let's move on to the next appetizer. Salad. A salad usually has some kind of vegetables mixed with cheese, egg, meat, nuts, or sometimes fruit. Well, when we have a mixture of words or phrases that are difficult to understand, we can call it a word salad. Word experts say that, in the past, word salad described difficult to understand spoken language from people with illnesses. However, in recent years, the expression word salad has come to simply mean difficult to understand language. Now let's move on to the main dish, in this case, a sandwich. You can make a sandwich from anything meat, cheese, vegetables, tofu, fish, shrimp, or chicken. Just put them between two pieces of bread, and you have a sandwich. You can even make a sandwich from criticism. A criticism sandwich is a way to soften the delivery of bad news. You put the criticism between two nice things, such as praise or approval. Here is an example. So, your performance in last week's sales meeting was great. Thanks for your help. But I'll need you to clean up the report. I saw a few things wrong with the numbers, but yeah, the client really loved your presentation. That could also be called a feedback sandwich, but it is made the same way. If you love sweets, you will love dessert. Now, I could use easy as pie or a piece of cake as examples. Both describe something very easy to do or finish. But I am going to use my favorite dessert, cookies. Some cookies are formed by hand, and their shapes can be very different from one another. However, some people use a device called a cookie cutter when making cookies. With a cookie cutter, every cookie is the same shape, with little difference. And that gives us the expression cookie cutter. It describes something similar to many other things. There is nothing special, extraordinary, or different about things that are cookie cutter. For example, houses in my neighborhood were made by the same builder. They are all the same size and shape. In other words, the houses in my neighborhood are cookie cutter houses. Thanks for joining me for this lunchtime version of Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about John Adams. In 1796, he was elected as the country's second president. Being second can be difficult, and being the second president of a new country, following a popular first president, such as George Washington, turned out to be extremely difficult. For one thing, Adams did not always get along with other people. He was known to get angry easily 
and often. Adams also was leader of a divided administration. His own vice president often disagreed with him, passionately. The situation was the result of a rule in the Constitution at the time. It said the person who received the majority of votes became president. The person with the second largest number of votes became vice president. The rule worked fine for the first two elections. Washington had won the presidency, and Adams won the vice presidency. The two men belonged to the same political party and shared many points of view. But in 1796, Adams' opponent in the election, Thomas Jefferson, became the vice president. The two men were personal friends, but political enemies. President Adams supported a strong federal government that protected the interests of business and the wealthy. Vice President Jefferson, on the other hand, wanted to limit the power of the federal government. As a result, Adams and Jefferson often clashed. Adams also made what many historians consider a mistake in choosing his cabinet. Adams simply kept George Washington's official advisers, mostly to satisfy political opponents. But later, Adams learned that many of his cabinet members opposed him too. Historian John Furling says, Adams was in over his head and started swimming upstream almost from the start of his presidency. On top of all that, Adams faced a foreign policy crisis. After the French Revolution, Great Britain allied with other European nations against France. They wanted to keep the unrest from spreading to their countries. Adams worked hard to make sure the U.S. did not get pulled into a war between France and Great Britain. But France did not trust the U.S. It tried to interrupt trade by seizing U.S. ships. Adams wanted to resolve the problem peacefully. He threatened military action, but he also sent diplomats to talk with French officials. Adams aimed for an honorable peace with France. It took some time, but he got it. Historian John Furling says, Although the crisis in Europe caused Adams endless trouble, he dealt with it well. Many years later, Adams wrote that the greatest jewel in his crown was reaching peace with France. Even if Adams struggled as president, he was successful in other parts of his life. He grew up outside the city of Boston. His father was a farmer, as well as a church official and town leader. However, Adams chose to attend Harvard University and become a lawyer. Adams was a very good lawyer. In fact, he was one of the busiest lawyers in Boston. His success enabled him to buy a big, two-story house that still stands in Quincy, Massachusetts. Adams also had a happy marriage. The relationship between him and his wife, Abigail, is one of the best known of that time. The two wrote many letters to each other during the years they were apart. More than 1,000 of their letters still survive today. John and Abigail Adams were both passionate patriots who supported the American Revolution. They also agreed about the issue of slavery. Unlike many founding families of the U.S., the couple did not own slaves and spoke out against the system of people owning other people.
November of 1800, John and Abigail Adams moved to the executive mansion in Washington, D.C. Adams was the first president to live in what we now call the White House. They would not stay long, however. Adams was facing a difficult re-election campaign. His vice president, Thomas Jefferson, was running against him. His party was divided. Many Federalists supported other candidates. And some voters did not like his decisions, including creating a permanent army, raising taxes, and limiting the rights of immigrants. Those four laws, called the Alien and Sedition Acts, extended the time that immigrants had to wait before becoming U.S. citizens. They permitted the government to detain citizens from enemy nations without reason during wartime. The laws also permitted the president to expel foreign citizens he believed were dangerous. And they made criticizing the president or Congress a crime. Adams said the acts aimed to control people in the U.S. who supported France. But many politicians at the time argued that the laws mostly affected people who supported the opposing political party. Historian John Furling says they were right. And, he says, Adams may have been using the Alien and Sedition Acts to protect his political career, but they ended up damaging his public image. They also raised the question for the first time of whether states had the right to ignore a federal law if they disagreed with it. Supporters of Vice President Thomas Jefferson used Adams' approval of the Alien and Sedition Acts against him effectively. Jefferson's campaign said Adams exercised so much power as president that he must want the U.S. to become a monarchy. Adams' campaign said Jefferson was a radical who would bring revolution to the country. The U.S. had never experienced such an ugly election before. Some people wondered whether the country would be able to transfer power peacefully. When Jefferson won, however, Adams did not resist. He retired to his farm in Massachusetts. Adams spent most of his retirement writing. He even began exchanging long letters with his old friend and old enemy, Thomas Jefferson. The two men discussed their families, their thoughts on politics and religion, and their nation's history. The letters were both personally and historically meaningful. Adams and Jefferson were the last living members of the original patriots who started a new country. On July 4, 1826, the nation's 50th birthday, the two friends, patriots, and former U.S. presidents died within hours of one another. <laughs> 